Have you ever felt like a tiny cog in a massive machine, carrying a workload far heavier than you should, with no one seeming to notice? Perhaps you're a nurse battling on the front lines of healthcare, juggling patient cases, long hours, and an ever-changing schedule that seems to have no rhyme or reason. Like many before you, the strain begins to wear you down, and the thought of leaving the profession crosses your mind more often than not. This seemingly bleak story is unfortunately not unique. In fact, a growing number of nurses are choosing to step away from their careers due to poor staffing and scheduling practices, causing a ripple effect that's damaging healthcare systems worldwide. But what if healthcare providers could effortlessly address their staffing challenges using software, ensuring fair, transparent, and sustainable scheduling for clinicians? Enter Mish AI, a solution to that very problem. Today, I'm thrilled to have joining me Professor Sharam Yousafi, the co-founder and CEO of this software. He'll share insights into how Mesh AI goes beyond the ordinary, crafting not just features, but a philosophy built upon the value of organizational harmony. Mesh AI calls itself a socially intelligent scheduler, offering comprehensive solutions. And it all begins with understanding clinician needs proactively. The number one challenge in healthcare today is really shortage of people specifically, no matter where, from Canada and U.S. all the way to India and Iran. And so we truly believe communication leads to better solutions. If you ask the right questions from people involved in healthcare and stakeholders, it's easier to get best solutions that nobody has been able to get to in the past at the same level of cost, same resources. And that's what we try to do with MeshAI, at least in the context of scheduling staff. Welcome to Digital Health Disruptors by Charm Health, empowering innovative clinicians on the digital health frontier. On this podcast, we explore the trials and triumphs of pioneers at the intersection of technology and healthcare. I'm your host, Ranjani Rangan. Picture a bustling hospital where doctors in white coats move with purpose, navigating a maze of hallways and rooms. Residents with stethoscopes around their necks rush to and fro, their steps synchronized with the urgency of their responsibilities. The air is filled with a sense of purpose, a constant hum of activity, as medical professionals strive to deliver care. In this dynamic setting, managing complex physician call schedules has been a historical challenge. It is complicated demanding, and expensive. Mesh AI steps in as an easy-to-use, affordable cloud-based option. It begins by gathering information about physician availability, shift preferences, and potential conflicts like vacation time. Using its algorithmic AI-powered capabilities, it automates the schedule creation process, meticulously following organizational rules with a single click. It swiftly adapts to changes in physician availability in real time, keeping schedules continually updated. But a defining feature of Mesh AI is its commitment to transparency and shared understanding. It goes the extra mile by communicating schedules to physicians and staff involved in the call schedule. Now, let's uncover the story behind building the startup. Professor Sharam Yousafi, it is wonderful to have you today. I'm really excited about our conversation. Ranjani, it's absolutely a pleasure. Thanks for having me. Professor Sharam is a rare double threat in both academia and healthcare. With over 16 years as a tenured professor and armed with a PhD in electrical engineering, he stands as an authority on communications, cloud systems, and algorithms. But his journey doesn't end there. With decades of leadership at Queen's University, he skillfully harnessed a wealth of expertise for product and algorithm development in telecom. So, how did a former electrical engineer solve the complex and nuanced scheduling issues within healthcare? You were a professor and you transitioned from telecom to healthcare. What inspired this shift after dedicating numerous years into the telecom industry? It's been roughly a 25 years that I've been doing research and development in telecom and data storage. And what brought me from telecom and academic life has always been 
the mathematical angle or algorithmic angle, signal processing, and later on changing to become what it is today, machine learning and artificial intelligence. And that really transformed itself very nicely and really helped me do what I ended up doing in healthcare because uh, the underlying problems were the same. Limited resources in healthcare and the reality that throwing money at the problem is not a solution. So I've always been trying to figure out what can we do to succeed with what we have. And one of the things that I really I became interested in was resource allocation, and optimization of resources. So I think that really at a high level was what I could bring in. The algorithm, technical know-how, along with those philosophical and foundational viewpoints on how to solve problems. Leveraging this extensive background, he's on a mission to address some of healthcare's most significant challenges worldwide, particularly focusing on improving access to workforces. But it turns out it isn't his resume, but his childhood he has to thank for prepping him to disrupt an entire industry that wasn't even his own. I grew up in Iran, and I was there for the eight years of Iran-Iraq war. Those were formidable years, the good and bad, the PTSD of going through a war, you know, missiles and bombardments, but all the resilience and resourcefulness that has to come. All of those things, I remember them very, very clearly. Many immigrants came from Iran seeking asylum, and I remember it was just an, a devastating time. Yeah, definitely, they've shaped me as a person I am today in terms of somebody who's extremely passionate about solving problems that remove conflicts and lead to harmony. No matter what I do from teaching a classroom to building a product, I'm always finding or trying to find solutions that benefit everybody because I don't believe in a zero-sum game in life. As we delve into Professor Sharam's life experiences, it becomes evident that his unique insights are poised to make a significant impact on the field of healthcare. Let's connect the dots. In the recent Mirror Mirror 2021 report from the Commonwealth Fund, the U.S. healthcare system finds itself at the bottom rung in access to care, administrative efficiency, equity, and health outcomes. In fact, comparing it to seven other nations, it's a stark reality check. The U.S. ranks dead last. The Global Health Security Index ranks the U.S. 32 out of 36 countries in terms of readiness for global health public emergencies. The story, sadly, doesn't get any better for nurses. In 2022, a lot of nurses in the U.S. started leaving their jobs. A survey by the Council of State Boards of Nursing predicts that by 2027, almost 900,000 nurses will have left the industry. To put it simply, about one in five of the nation's 4.5 million registered nurses are thinking about quitting during this period. Because of Burnout, what, what's the reason? There are many reasons given, but at the end of the day, bottom line, it comes down to healthcare being very unhealthy, not accommodating. A near fatal experience that I had in healthcare opened up my eyes to the sense of burnout, stress, yeah. anxiety, and staff being overworked, no matter where you look, from nurses all the way to physicians. And then the challenges of scheduling these people accurately and more harmoniously, more humanely rather than calling them heroes and expecting them to go beyond what is humanly possible, acknowledging that clinicians are human beings like you and I, and they need balance in their life. They have families, they have kids, they have grandparents to take care of. How do we allow them to participate in healthcare in the way that makes sense for them and minimizes work-life conflicts for them and accommodates them, right? Listens to them and, and includes them in the process. To Professor Sharam, scheduling frontline workers with respect was a complex problem worth solving. I would like to dive into the heart of Mesh AI, which is your algorithm, which have been hailed as your secret sauce. What makes these algorithms specifically tailored for healthcare? So you touched on a very important part. The engine is the heart of Mesh AI. We fundamentally want to address that, that people have no questions and as a result, no complaints. Scheduling problems are the hardest mathematical problems we know, scientifically speaking. These are NP, uh, non-deterministic polynomials. What it means is that when you go from 10 people to 20 people, the complexity of solving the scheduling problem doesn't double. It grows exponentially. I think the secret with Mesh AI is really the agility 
and the augmented intelligence aspect of it to understand for this particular type of a schedule. Is it five pediatric physicians in a clinic or am I talking about 100 family medicine residents in, you know, Palo Alto, Stanford Health? These are fundamentally different kinds of problems. The ability for us to be able to switch around and dynamically address the solving methodology based on what we see. I think that's what makes us unique. So how do you differentiate yourself with traditional apps that have been there in the past and also with the modern scheduling apps that have been popular in the last two, three years? That's a very good question. When we did hundreds and hundreds of interviews when the product was launched out of a university lab, these are residents, fellows, physicians, nurses that allowed us to figure out what the problem is. Why does the problem exist? We're sending man to the moon. Why are people scheduling their staff in healthcare with the spreadsheets and maybe rudimentary software? So we realized that there were two challenges. One was the diversity of workflow. Teams or lines of service can have dramatically different ways of looking at the scheduling. So workflows are very diverse. And then the rules, collective agreements, guidelines that people use to generate these schedules, rudimentary systems such as Amoyon and spreadsheets to more advanced systems. At the end of the day, those are also very diverse too. So the question was on the table, is it technically possible with technologies of the day? that we build a system that can accommodate that level of versatility and flexibility. But how does Mesh AI, the underdog, manage to compete head-to-head with enterprise giants? According to Professor Sharam, competitors like Amion fall short in customization. Additionally, part of the secret lies in its powerful mathematical algorithm and how it manages to walk the fine line of rotation-dependent schedules, on-call duties, and all of the clinical requirements seamlessly. You have clinical requirements, and you got postgraduate requirements from ACGME in the United States and Canada for residency programs. And then you have the local requirements of the healthcare team. When you put all of these things together, you're looking at the most challenging mathematical problem in scheduling, Right. right? If we fail, we fail. But if we solve it, that's going to be our moat. That's going to be our barrier to competition. And that ended up being the case. Super. So do you have a patent? My view on patent is this. If you can't prosecute, don't patent. So being the company we wear with limited resources, really putting our head down, focused on building the product that our clinicians are asking for, we thought patenting what we have, in fact, is counterproductive. So we decided to go towards the path of secret recipe. That might change in the future when we have more oomph and more money to actually go and prosecute in the U.S. because it is a 21% GDP, about four and a half, five trillion dollar economy. We thought that is actually more efficient and impactful to not go after patents. Did you feel like it's like throwing toe boots into the process and slowing down your innovation? Very much so. Not only taking away resources, money and time, but also, you know, increasing competition in this space. Professor Sharam, you mentioned a lot about equity, and this is so fundamental and so important. However, from a business point of view, a hospital might say, well, we want some of our best providers to be at the front lines to serve our patients. How will that work if you're having equity integrated into the clinician system? That's a very good point. So this is completely in line with what Mesh AI does through the engine. You could have four physicians that have the same output same type of skills or qualifications that at any moment in time, when you click on a mesh AI shift and you want to make a decision, oh, I have an open shift for tomorrow, you click on it and the list shows you four possibilities out of your 50 staff, that those four possibilities are equally good given your economics, given your patients, given your continuity of care concentrations, things like that. Mesh AI is very sophisticated when it comes to the engine to be able to accommodate exactly those sorts of economic as well as clinical requirements. So we do that. So on that front, you know, when I look at equity, diversity, inclusion, diversity is is inviting people to your dinner table. Inclusion is letting them set the table with you, right? So when it comes to building Mesh AI, our viewpoint is that you really have to let this be a conversation. It's good that I have people from diverse backgrounds, qualifications, speed, and other things on my team, but can I let them participate in the processes such as scheduling?
Are you ready to revolutionize healthcare at the point of care? Discover the Charm Health platform, a perfect ecosystem where technologists and clinician entrepreneurs connect, ideate, and thrive. To find out more about what we do, visit us at charmhealthchallenge.com. When we spoke earlier, you mentioned that a lot of how you built your startup, specifically in terms of funding your startup, was very lean. Can we go into a little bit about that? Definitely. We've been very lean in the sense that how do we get there responsibly with the resources we have today without having to go to investors and entirely the whole money that comes through revenue is fed back into R&D. We are extremely first R&D type environment. And I think that's one of the things that makes us unique is just we're constantly evolving and improving. Interestingly enough, uh, I'll give you a number today, 85% of sales we do and conversions we do to Mesh AI are through referrals. These are physicians, residents, and fellows that end up seeing the product or using the product, and then they tell others. You were funded by doctors, correct? And, the, and you had put the money in a holding firm? It was very natural that the physicians came forward and wanted to invest and be a part of it. And, and that happened through advising us and sitting on the product team and really informing our MVP production and all the subsequent versions of the product and a holding company that was formed. And that became the injector of the first capital that allowed us to build this super front, front end heavy endeavor of building a SaaS product, cloud product. So that was really the starting point for us. In demanding fields like emergency medicine and anesthesiology, a doctor's annual income is closely woven into the calls or shifts they handle. Here, not all calls are the same. Some go beyond medical complexity, bringing stress, pain, and conflict that uniquely affect their personal lives. As a result, physician doctors working alongside Professor Sharam eagerly stepped forward, providing wise advice or actively joining the product team. Their keenness to play a crucial role in developing the minimum viable product, MVP, significantly influenced how Mesh AI evolved. Your initial MVP product, how different is it from today? I think our view on MVP was very wrong. And one of the things that I've learned is that a lot of times people think uh, minimum viable product, the focus on the first word minimum is, for a lot of people is cost and time. What is the fastest, cheapest thing I can get out there? And that's fundamentally wrong. We almost made that mistake too. Understanding that MVP is the thing you can get out that maximizes entropy uh, or reduces the highest level of uncertainty around the product. Let's take a step back and break this down. Normally, people think the MVP, minimum viable product, is the quickest and cheapest fix for a problem. But Professor Sharam has a different idea. He talks about an MVP that really gets to the heart of things, which he calls a maximizing entropy. Basically, it means cutting down on the biggest uncertainties about a product. Think of entropy like a metaphor. It helps us see the uncertainty and resistance to change in healthcare. If we get what people in healthcare are worried about, we can reduce this uncertainty and resistance. Now I know you're an academic, you use the word entropy. One of the things I've learned is that I, we have to understand it, put ourselves in their place, and then we can talk, then we can build. So for us, being able to accommodate that, that was a game changer. But yet, not for everybody, there is a niche that you're serving. One of the biggest mistakes we made was the fact that we thought we could go a bit more horizontal, no matter where they are, what expertise they have. We knew that right off the bat, that as engineers, technologists, we're just going to build another product that ends up being either useless or hurting healthcare more than it helps. That's one of the things I love about Charm EHR. One of the things that really brought me to the innovation challenge and Charm Health was that any user of Mesh AI who knew Charm said amazing things about the product. That sets it apart from the other EHRs and EMRs, hundreds of which you and I can mention uh, right away, right? And so we wanted to do the same thing. We wanted to be relevant. We wanted to make sure that people who are going to end up sitting behind their mobile phones and computers using the product really influence the product roadmap and what the definition of an MVP, minimum viable product, should be. So we brought people in healthcare to help us build it. Through those conversations, we really realized that you know, maybe after wasting some resources that we need to go very narrow. Super. You've talked about product market fit in a previous conversation, but you're saying product channel fit is even more important. Can you give me an example of what you've done 
that has proved that to you? Absolutely. I knew we had product market fit when our product was very imperfect and people were still coming. People knew we had challenges on the mobile side. In fact, we had to revamp the entire mobile last year. We built it from scratch on iOS and Android because we had made mistakes and we were very open about it. And it was something that people knew because we were very open and candid about it and they were still coming to us. That was really the sign that we had product market fit. And we knew we had product market channel fit when we all of a sudden had this scalable machine that was generating more and more interest at top of the funnel, more and more people that knocked on the door. So the majority of people making a demo on Mesh AI are coming to us. They come to Mesh AI platform and book a demo and it's very, very painless and easy. And then we do that in the 45 minute Zoom meeting. And by the end of that, we qualify or disqualify. In fact, we're very, very picky, Ranjani. We disqualify half the people that come to us because we don't think the product is the perfect fit that we want it to be. We're very, very purposeful about who we support, who we sell to. Professor Sharam emphasizes the importance of promoting Mesh AI to those who genuinely believe it's a game changer for their team. Creating an awesome product is a must, and that's the product market fit. They knew they were onto something when people kept coming back, even with some product flaws. But here's another crucial point. How Mesh AI gets out there, and that's the product channel fit. It's not about pleasing everyone. It's about tailoring the product and its presentation to precisely match what users want. By being a little selective, Mesh AI ensures it's crafting a satisfying experience that aligns with the platform's long-term goals. And the criterion we use is that if six months down the road, we ask Ranjani, what do you think about Mesh AI? We want to hear nothing but five out of five star. If we have any indication that this might not be the case, we disqualify and don't sell. So that sounds counterproductive when you think about revenue maximization. But again, we have visions of long term and we want to be the brand that we are today, that people think of us. And this is the language of our customers that think Mesh AI is a partner, not a vendor. Professor Sharam, what's intriguing to me is that even though the mobile app had not optimal features or maybe they had problems as you defined it, they still stayed on. We have a team called Clinician Success, really showing right off the bat to people we hire all the way to external people that we are clinician focused. We have a number of foundational principles and one of them is candor. So we're extremely open when we make mistakes. We own it. We go back to our customers and we take responsibility and we go above and beyond, mm. minimize the impact. I think mm-hmm. that's rare from the moment that you have a problem on your cell phone and you got to get on it, talk to your ISP, internet challenges. You know, we talk to customer support very, very often, right? It is very rare that you mm-hmm. can come out of that experience and you can say, yeah, I got what I wanted as fast as and exactly the way I wanted. Our satisfaction score after every single ticket is 100%. Mm-hmm. 100% for eight months in a row now. Nobody's perfect, but we own it. We go beyond what is doable by others. Well, I think this is the thing that keeps people engaged and committed to Mesh AI despite the challenges. Mesh AI believes they have generated a new category of scheduling, collaborative scheduling reshaping scheduling dynamics, where it doesn't have to be draining resources or impacting the bottom line. Instead, it can metamorphosize into a fluid conversation and collaboration. I've seen that you've introduced a lot of new vocabulary. I see words like collaborative scheduling, socially intelligent scheduler, and anti-scheduler. It seems to me you're not just innovating, but you're trying to stir up things in healthcare and almost make a point Do you think that this is being a disruptor? That's a hard question to answer. Ranjani, you asked some wonderful set of questions today that I have to continue thinking about in the future. Typically, people talk about patient outcomes, patient satisfaction, patient experience. We truly believe we can get to those, but we cannot do that before we put the oxygen mask on our own face, right? And that's why we use the term anti-scheduler for a lot of people say, this is not the scheduler you're looking for. It's an anti-scheduler. It's really, really focusing on something that is eating healthcare today. I truly believe shortage of workforce and not managing workforce well is eating healthcare today. So that's the problem we're going after. The term anti-scheduler means, define it for me. 
the anti-scheduler is really a tongue-in-cheek way of talking about a scheduling that is very different. And we let the engine that doesn't take sides goes and mathematically optimizes and comes up with a schedule that is perceptively the best given the limited resources we have. So it's really the same thing, maybe different linguistics, but really uh, taking a different view on a scheduling that, you know, instead of what we inherited from the last industrial revolution, can we do better? Mesh AI reduces the amount of time that is spent on a scheduling by 80%. This is significant. And this is time spent by physicians. Really, really exciting to be able to give that back to patients. And you're talking about 100 clinicians trying to schedule that. That has got to be an expensive ordeal to do scheduling for them. Tell me a little bit about your pricing strategy. Is it attractive? How do you keep it attractive? A lot of people have misconceptions that this is going to be unaffordable. It's one of our biggest challenges. People say, oh, I don't think I can afford it. And when we mention, oh, it starts from 200, 250 bucks a month, all of a sudden their eyebrows are raised and say, okay, tell me more. So early on, we ask us, we ask this question, can we build a solution for this very challenging technological issue, but make it affordable? We come to a place where right now we can say we're democratizing uh, augmented intelligence or intelligent scheduling in healthcare. Our pricing is not a function of number of users, which is very common in this space. And in my opinion, a cash grab mm -hmm. is a function of the complexity of a scheduling problem. It's just fair to charge people based on that because that's how we pay Amazon Web Services when we run the beast. The massive mm -hmm. engine for Meshia runs on AWS. I see. The second line item for our cost because yeah. it's a massive engine. So we have teams of 100 physicians that have a particular line of service that involves only five calls a day. They pay 200 bucks a month. And then we have also five physicians that have the same thing, five lines or you know, one line or five line that involves only five items per day on the calendar. So it's really the number of items per calendar and unlimited users. Attention, clinician entrepreneurs and technologists. Are you ready to revolutionize healthcare at the point of care? Discover the Charm Health platform, a perfect ecosystem where technologists and clinician entrepreneurs connect, ideate, and thrive. To find out more about what we do, visit us at charmhealthchallenge.com. Mesh AI is clear on taking its own path, steering clear of being bought over by larger EMRs. This enables them to stay product focused rather than fading into obscurity. We don't need to integrate with the EMR yet, and we don't need to integrate with payroll systems and such. There are categories of scheduling that require that, but we've managed to stay away from that and focus on systems that can run in a silo. And, and that allows us to go from demo to full launch in five to six weeks. If we wanted to integrate with you know, Epic EMR, that would not be the same. The number of people that are involved, or approval processes that you have to go through, all of that will change. How do you know that you are not building a feature rather than a product? That's a very good point. Our junior engineers to our salespeople are always on the same page with our principles. We developed something called the 10 Commandments of Product Success to stay ahead of the curve and avoid exactly that pitfall. We're building a brand, not a product. We truly believe that we're building a philosophy and brand, and that's how we position Mesh AI in the market, in the minds and hearts of our clinicians, that we are a product built for people who care for their people. So that's that, and it really shows itself in how we sell, how we price, how we do support, how we do setup, and really every core of our existence. If a venture capitalist were to ask you, you know, well, there are so many schedules out there and AI is changing so fast, and tomorrow your algorithm won't make sense because our artificially intelligent clinician scheduling systems will be able to solve that problem in just a matter of seconds just as well. What do you have to say? At the end of the day, a schedule could be mathematically perfect. Mm -hmm. but if it's not perceived to be good or perfect, you missed the point. And that's okay. one of the things on my AI, we focus on really building a set of rules and engine for each team that we support in such a way that when people look at their schedule, they say, yeah, that, this was the best schedule we could get. That's a tough problem. It revolves around what we call perceptual equity, grasping what each person and team views as fair. This concept varies not just across cultures, but even between teams within the same hospital. What seems fair to one department might differ for another. 
For now, AI struggles to achieve this nuanced understanding. The challenges of scheduling that we have seen over the past 10 years do not lend themselves, at least for foreseeable future, for simple off-the-shelf ML AI, Gen AI type solutions, unfortunately. What advice would you like to share with our digital health entrepreneurs and clinicians who are looking to make that positive impact in the healthcare industry? I would say to succeed in this space, you really have to be passionate about the problem. If you're not passionate about healthcare problems, don't come. I think you really have to be passionate about making a difference because it is a challenging environment and there are easier ways to make money. The second part of that is that resolution in terms of focus. You really need to focus on a very narrow specific problem. So advice I say I give to entrepreneurs that I advise, look at a $20 billion market with B, capital V, but start with a $20 million market. Find a solution that really makes a difference for $20 million, which is not venture-backed probably, but with that idea and vision that this is going to translate at the right time, move towards that $20 billion market. I think that's mm-hmm. really a game changer for you to mm-hmm. get traction early on, get people to, you know, the early adopters, those in the left of technology adoption, normal cycle to come on, support you, talk about you, and then push you and let you grow and enter with the, you know, the majority. I think we have an audience here that would be very intrigued to know what books you read. Absolutely. Yeah. Yeah. I, I absolutely love reading. I want to give you two yeah. The first one is the book that is old. Uh, it's called Four Agreements by Miguel Ruiz. I love the book because it basically summarizes everything in life that he says, uh, you know, bottom line, regardless of what religion you have, what principles you have, if you subscribe to four agreements that really cause frictions, and if you're aware of them, maybe reduce frictions and make your relationships more harmonious and forget everything else. So these four have really been helpful to me as an academic and somebody who always was in pursuit of perfection, which is the killer of entrepreneurship and growth. The other one that on the entrepreneurship side, The Hard Thing About Hard Things by Ben Horowitz. I love that book. You know, as a venture capitalist, builder, operator, he talks about some of his wartime and peacetime stories, building venture. There are many, many extremely insightful, unique, and really direct, candid comments about building a product, building a company. Thanks so much for sharing that. I wanted to say thank you for these tough questions that made me think and will continue to make me think and find better solutions, answers. I just want to say if you are a clinician, if you know somebody in healthcare who's not happy, doesn't feel healthy, ask him how they are. Just don't make assumptions. And if scheduling is a challenge, have them check out meshai.io. It's a shameless plug-in, but really, we are in a mission to make things better for people in healthcare, and money is not a problem. Uh, We always find creative ways to support even the most budget-limited teams. So we're here to help. Fantastic. Thank you, Professor Sharam. As we wrap up another enlightening episode of Digital Health Disruptors, we'd like to express our gratitude to Professor Sharam for sharing his invaluable insights and expertise. We hope you, our listeners, have gained fresh perspectives and inspiration from today's conversation. The world of digital health and innovation is a dynamic one, and we're here to guide you through it. If you enjoyed this episode and want to stay connected with the latest in healthcare technology and entrepreneurship, don't forget to subscribe, rate, and review our podcast. Your feedback fuels our mission to deliver top-notch content. Stay tuned for more exciting interviews with visionaries, innovators, and disruptors in the digital health space. We're dedicated to bringing you the stories that redefine the future of healthcare. Until next time, keep innovating, stay fearless, and continue to be part of the disruption that's shaping the future of healthcare. We'll see you next episode.